Well, as always, let me start by welcoming you to our worship of God here this Sunday morning. Lovely to see you all here gathered in the building. And uh, I hope that you'll enjoy the opportunity to share with one another in the worship of God. We're glad to welcome you as well as you share with us online today. Uh, wherever you are, whatever your circumstances, it's always our pleasure to welcome you to share with us in our service of worship here. Let us then join together to worship God and sound out our praise in the words of the Christmas song, God rest you, merry gentlemen. Join then in prayer now together. Let us all pray. 
Uh, living God, how glad we are always that it is that message that sounds out again to us every Christmas time as you remind us that in the gift of your Son it is to afford to us a joy that this world can never give and to minister to us that comfort in the face of all the trials, all the sorrows, all the pains that are ours. How glad we are, living God, to acknowledge your own greatness, your own glory, to rejoice in the splendor of your own being, all that you are as our great creator, the God who made this world, the God who runs this world, and you do all things so wisely, so well, and with such astonishing power and mercy. We bless you, praise you gladly. And above all, we praise you always for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, crucified on our behalf, now risen from the dead, and ascended on high, having poured out his Holy Spirit upon his people. And therefore, on this day, the Lord's day, we gladly rejoice in all that you are and in all that you've done and in all that you have given and pray simply that you would be our enabling by your Holy Spirit as we bring our praise and our worship to you, that as we open our hearts to you in praise, you would indeed draw near to us by your Spirit and make yourself known to us. Come among us then, living God, we pray you. Accept our praise, poor as it is, that we offer to you in this manner, and grant that from our hearts there may indeed be that worship, that delight, that gratitude that uh, indeed honors and, and gladdens your heart. So grant us your help and blessing now as we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, Jill is now going to come and read the Bible passage for us. If you have a Bible, you might like just to get it out and have a look. Jill is going to come and read the passage for us. We're reading today from Luke chapter 1 and verse 23. When Zechariah's time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and has taken away my disgrace among the people. And again, at verse, we read again at verse 39, Mary visits Elizabeth. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the, the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Amen. What, uh, what we're going to be thinking about this morning is uh, the visit that Mary made to Elizabeth and Zechariah. And uh, the worksheet that's uh, available for you on the, the website, uh, you can have a look at it later. But uh, we'll be thinking about the, the way in which Elizabeth welcomed Mary to her home and uh, the way in which the two of them were able to be a support and an encouragement and a help to one another. And uh, the kind of key verse that I've put up there on the screen for you is uh, simply that, what uh, uh, the passage that Jill read ends with, where Elizabeth says, blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has promised, that what he's promised uh, will indeed be accomplished. And, and that's always the, the kind of heart of what uh, God means us to understand, that as we, we listen to what he has to say in the Bible, as we believe the promises, then we enter into the full measure of his blessing. Um, and so taking God at his word, believing what he says, and then applying that to our lives is what, what God means us to do. He always keeps his promises. And he's come in Jesus to fulfill absolutely every promise that he's made in the Bible. And uh, so we can trust him for that and uh, enjoy uh, living our lives with him and for him. 
Uh, when you get in a minute to the, the Sunday School, um, you'll be looking at material that uh, Sam has prepared for you, a series of videos again through the web, and those are available on the website as always. Uh, just click on uh, the heading resources and uh, you'll get the material there under Sunday School. Uh, so I hope you enjoy that. We're going to sing, um, before you go out, we're going to sing another Christmas song, uh, Angels from the Realms of Glory.
again, let's now bow together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Our gracious God and Father, as we gather here this morning, it is always with that desire that we might meet with yourself, for in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you have drawn near to us. You have come, come all that distance from the glory and perfection of eternity into this squalid history of humankind. And you have come because you have seen our misery, you have heard our cries, and you have come intent upon delivering us from that which has been a bondage, that which has brought us burdens, that which has seen us stained and tainted. And we humbly bow before yourself, living God, our great creator, and acknowledge that we are but creatures and sinful, rebellious creatures at that. That our first and primary need has always been for forgiveness. And it is a wonder to us that in and through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you have wrought that forgiveness for us. By the righteousness that is his and his alone. And we thank you, living God, that... He has come and he has lived for us in the face of all the temptations, all the trials, all the pressures, all the stresses that we experience. He has lived that life of matchless obedience, a righteous life lived for your own praise and glory. And more than that, to fulfill all righteousness, he has then born in his own body on our behalf the righteous condemnation of a holy God upon our sin. And how we thank you, living God, that that dual righteousness of your Son has now been given to all who trust in him. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter how miserably we may have failed you, no matter how often we may have gone astray, given freely to all you declare who believe in him that we should not perish but should have eternal life. We thank you for that, our Father. And how we thank you that even as through these days we do deliberately come and seek to bring our worship to the one born back then at Bethlehem and to delight in him as the one who is the Christ, who is the King, the one who has come to be for us all that we needed him to be. So we do so, Father, in days when the depravity of the world in which we live, the waywardness of humanity, our constant reliance upon our own resources rather than humbly turning to you, our creator, is all around us. And the very virus that has plagued this world is in so many ways a powerful visual picture for us of the condition that is ours as men and women and girls and boys. We are, living God, infected with the most dreadful virus of all, the virus of sin. And how we thank you that in your Son, you have provided not a vaccine, but a complete antidote, a healing, which one day will see us delivered and made whole at last. And we thank you for that, our Father. We are conscious, our gracious God, that we live in a world in which there is much sorrow, so many different stresses, so much in the way of suffering, so many different problems that people have and wrestle with, some of them physical, some of them relational, some of them mental, some of them financial, occasional context. And Father, as we thank you for the ways in which you gift different individuals throughout our society with a whole panoply of gifts, enabling our scientists to develop with such rapidity a vaccine with a view to preventing the spread and protecting as best may be so many in our society. 
We're conscious also, living God, as we thank you for the astonishing progress made by so many throughout the scientific world over these past months in the development of these vaccines. We're conscious that as these vaccines then get rolled out, the pressure upon so many others is simply exacerbated. The sheer administrative task, the logistics of ensuring that vaccines are in the right place at the right time for the right people. And we pray, living God, for all for whom these days involve just a mountain of extra work on top of the mountain of work that was before them as it was. And we thank you, living God, for that infrastructure within our society whereby so many different individuals in their day-by-day -day lives contribute to the welfare of the whole. We pray, living God, for those who are at this time feeling the strain most keenly after months and months of pressure. We pray, living God, that you would sustain those who are in the thick of things, that you would refresh those, our God, who are wearied and fatigued, that you would protect those who, whose living exposes them constantly to the hazards of this virus, that you would grant us grace, living God, in all our different contexts, to be mindful of the needs of those around us, careful of the welfare of others, and seeking in all things, guided as we seek to be by those who govern us, and guided above all by the dictates of your word. We pray, living God, that you would lead us by your Holy Spirit and use us even in these days for your praise and glory. We remember those, our Father, who are ill at this time, some with COVID-19, others with a whole range of different conditions, and ask that even as we remember them by name before you in our hearts, you would draw near to them and afford to them your comfort, that sense of your own gracious healing hand laid upon them for good. We pray, living God, for those who are most vulnerable, and ask that you would grant them your protection and your help the very elderly, in all that the protracted period of confinement and isolation has entailed for them, and the very young, our Father, those newly born, those still growing within the womb. We pray, gracious God, your protective hand upon each and every one. And we pray, Lord God, for those who have been bereaved, that you would comfort them in their sorrow, solace them in that grief whose depths you alone are able fully to fathom. And grant living God to those set in authority over us and the responsibilities that they bear in our society, not only in the context of uh, the spread of coronavirus, but in the context of all the Brexit negotiations that are taking place, in the context of all the whole spectrum of responsibilities that rest upon their shoulders in the realm of education, in the realm of health, and the realm of the protection of our society, the security services, the emergency services, right across the spectrum, living God, give them wisdom in the exercise of their responsibilities, that they may be enabled by your Spirit so to govern wisely and well for the true well-being of our society as a whole. And grant, living God, that as those who have come by your grace to know the Lord Jesus Christ, may we ourselves in our day-by-day -day lives be enabled to be harbingers of that great hope that he has given to us, that a better day is indeed coming. May we bring hope where there is otherwise despair. May we bring peace where otherwise there is turmoil. May we strengthen those who are weak. May we comfort those who mourn. And grant, living God, that we may be instruments of your grace and of your healing and of your rich and fulsome blessing. 
So hear us, our Father, in all these our prayers and in all the unspoken prayers of our hearts as we ask them all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, before we turn in a moment or two to the Word of God again, we're going to join in the singing of another Christmas carol cradled in a manger mainly. Uh, just bow in prayer as we turn to the word of God our Father you have given us your word and we're glad of that glad that you speak through that word by your spirit is your voice it is your word it is your son that we long always to meet and to know and that mystery our God can only be a reality in our experiences your Holy Spirit ministers his word to us. So would you grant us that grace and that blessing now as we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, it is the passage that Jill read for us a little bit earlier in our service that we're going to be looking at over the course of these four Advent Sundays. We're really just working our way through Luke chapter 1, which sees Luke providing us with the, the prequel to the birth of the Lord Jesus. A significant prequel. Uh, Luke doesn't waste his space 
Um, it is very deliberate on his part that he starts with this elderly couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, who in many ways he means us to recognize are uh, an echo of the, the ones to whom that first great promise was made in Genesis chapter 12, Abram and Sarah, another elderly couple uh, who had not children. And here is the God who made that promise way back then and said, I will bless you, I'll make you a blessing to all nations. And this God now bringing to fulfillment what he had promised way back then. And there are a lot of lessons for us to learn, not least uh, at this particular juncture in our history and in this particular year. It's been a very strange year in many ways. We sometimes wonder what on earth is going on. And it's quite striking to see in how many regards uh, what what we experience is actually paralleled in the Christmas narrative. And so last Sunday in the opening uh, 22 verses or so, what we saw there was a man who was on mute. Uh, and that's been something that we are very conscious of, particularly when we gather for worship, particularly in the exercise of that priestly function that we have of sounding out the praise of God and all the more as we come into this Christmas season where it, it just goes entirely against the grain for us to, to be sharing in the praise of God but unable to sound out that praise. We too are on mute and uh, I, I don't think that it's coincidental that the Christmas narrative begins like that, God intent upon doing something and there's a sense in which he, he shuts his people up. And he shuts his people up for a good reason that I hope will become a little bit more apparent today. Because what we find today is, is another striking parallel with our own situation. We find a couple who are obliged to work from home. Uh, that, in essence, is what we find here. You see the, the threefold reference there in the passage that Jill read, as if to underline that that's now the context where things are happening. Zechariah the priest goes home. And in uh, that home, Elizabeth, we're told, verse uh, 24, 25, she is in seclusion. She is cut off from other people. And Mary comes to the home of Zechariah. You will see verse 39. Um, there is this focus, in other words, upon um, the home of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And I guess if you had previously asked Zechariah and Elizabeth, uh, where is the, the kind of focal point of the life and the ministry that you exercise, probably both of them would have said, probably the temple. The guy's a priest, that's his, his ministry, that's his calling under God. They both came from the household of Aaron. Uh, they had priesthood in their blood. And the temple, they would have assumed that's where it happens. And now the focus shifts in these verses to their home. And for a period of some 10 months or so, they are effectively working from home. And, and that's meant to ring a few bells with us because although for some, obviously, uh, they, they still work in their normal place, uh, it has become a phenomenon throughout our society that we have been obliged in many regards in a way that has been different from previously to be working from home. And uh, um, it is a significant part of the Christmas narrative from which we are surely meant to learn. Uh, sometimes what, what happens when things don't work out the way we want them to work out, when things don't happen the way we think they should work out, when things are frustrating for us, we just vent our frustrations. And uh, instead of that, there, there really is a need for us to, to learn as to uh, how we, we actually utilize the context that has been given to us. And very strikingly here uh, in this narrative, we find that the Lord confronts us with two individuals who are devout, who love the Lord. Uh, there's no doubt about that, I think, who, who've uh, sought to use their lives and to live their lives for the praise of God. Um, and they are having to learn how to live out their life and how to honor their Lord and how to serve him in their day-by-day -day lives in a slightly different context. They're having to adapt 
And I think that there are um, two important lessons for us to learn from these verses that we read that correspond to the, the two parts of the reading, verses 23 to 25. First of all, make it clear, I think, that uh, that working from home gives people the opportunity uh, and the time to reflect. Uh, and that, under God, it may be, is something that his people have needed to do. It may be that we have been in our lives, and it may be that we have been in our Christian lives as we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been way too busy. We have been seeking to do this, that, and the next thing. And it may be that that's what he means us to be learning, the, the need to reflect, the need to be still, the need to take time apart. And so we find uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth having to work here from home. And what we, we find here is that there is this opportunity to reflect. As Zechariah goes home, we find that for five months uh, they are in seclusion. Uh, Elizabeth is pregnant and she is in seclusion. Now, we kind of assume uh, as we slip over that, that there's, there's nothing of any real consequence in that. But, but it is important for us to recognize something of what is going on because at the end of five months, she is saying something in verse 25 that is profoundly important. What she is articulating is a clear statement, basically, of the gospel. And five months stuck in the home with her husband like that has obliged the two of them to think through all that has been happening to them and to understand the better and the more clearly what the gospel actually is. And you'll see there at verse 25 how she says, um, the Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace from among the people. Now that is, as I say, that's at the end of the five months, and I think we're meant to read it as the, the kind of conclusion to the reflection of the past five months where she has been in seclusion, where she has been stuck in her home, where she hasn't had that contact with a whole load of other people. She hasn't been able to go out for coffee. She hasn't been able to take the trips to the shops or anything like that. She has been stuck in her home, and all that she can do in a sense is, is kind of think through what has been going on. And that's what she comes out with. She has a clear grasp now of the gospel in a way that it would seem neither she nor Zechariah quite clearly had previously. And you'll see the, the three components there of her conviction. First of all, the power of God. The Lord has done this. And, and that, in many ways, is indicative of a, a lady who has at last grasped that the essence of the gospel is not what we do, not our service, not our priesthood, not our activity, not our duties. It is what he does. The Lord has done this. And she is clearly speaking about herself and her own condition, the, the miracle, and that is against the backdrop of her praying. The Lord has heard your prayer, the angel told Zechariah, and it is his doing in response to their prayer. And, and they, in a sense, have been deliberately sidelined by the Lord for this period so that they might understand it is not their doing, it is not anyone else's doing, it is his doing. That is the gospel. He does what needs to be done for us. And it may be that we are being reminded ourselves in these days in having to work from home where we have not been able to do here or elsewhere a lot of the things that by and large we have hitherto enjoyed doing, been glad to do, and sought to do for the glory of God. As if the Lord says, I don't actually need you to do it. I'm very happy for you to be doing it, but, but don't get the idea that somehow it is what you do that actually does anything. It is the Lord who does it. And it may just be that um, as Zechariah and Elizabeth presumably got it, that it's the Lord who does this, in answer to their prayer, it may be that the Lord flags up for us 
the degree to which we live out our lives in a largely prayerless manner. And uh, our prayerlessness sometimes conveys the, the, the sense that actually we think we can do it without his help. And it, it is in the life of any congregation, prayer that is to be right at the very heart, where we recognize we cannot do anything. We cannot do anything. And therefore, if we would see anything being done for the glory of God, it can only be because he does it. And therefore, we ask him and we beseech him and we beg him and say, Lord, please, will you not do that? And here's Elizabeth, I think, getting that. That it has been as they have looked to the Lord in prayer and as they have sought him and said, you must do this, Lord. Then she's coming and says, so you have done this. The Lord has done this. There's the power of God. Then there is the love of God that she has grasped the more clearly. Uh, I think the NIV mistranslates uh, what is actually there because it doesn't actually say he has shown me favor. Uh, what the, the original says is the Lord has looked upon me. And it's the same word that is used back in Exodus. Same word that the, the Greek translation of Exodus chapter 3 verse 7 uses where, where the Lord says, I have seen your misery. Um, that's what she's pointed to. That's the, the, the terminology that she is using. The Lord has seen her misery, looked upon her plight, and the whole essence of all that the Lord says back there in, uh, in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 is simply this, that uh, uh, behind it lies his love. I have seen your misery. I've heard your cry. I've felt your pain, and so I've come to rescue you. Um, it is the love that God has, that covenant love, that pledged love that he has for his people that lies behind it. And she has grasped all over again that, that what happened way back then at the time of the Exodus where the Lord looked upon his people is now happening to her as well. He is looking again upon his people. He has looked upon her in her need. It is the immensity and the wonder of the love of God that is expressed not only to a nation way back then in history, but in the here and now as well in the life of an individual such as her. So the power of God and then the love of God. And then thirdly, there is the grace of God. The Lord has done this. He has shown his favor towards me and has taken from me my disgrace among the people. Um, that's what he does in the gospel for us in Jesus Christ. He removes from us that disgrace and replaces it with his grace, whereby he removes from us everything that is our shame, everything that stains and taints our lives. He has removed that from us. That's what he has come to do. Here is a woman, in other words, who after three, five months has, has got what the gospel actually is. It is about the power of God, about the love of God, and about the grace of God. He comes to do it all. And uh, it, it may well be that the Lord um, obliges us to adopt a, a different pattern of life, a different rhythm to our lives in order that we might slow down sufficiently and have the time and the space to reflect upon what he is doing and what he says in his word and to understand all over again the essence of the gospel. The Lord has done this. And it may be that part of the challenge of these days is for us as individuals, as a fellowship, to ask ourselves the extent to which we root our life in prayer, conscious that only he does anything. Our activity, our endeavors, our doing this, that, and the next thing doesn't do anything. The Lord does it. And will we not ask him, therefore, please, Lord, do it. When you look out upon the land in which we live, and you see the, the extent to which our society has drifted and then deliberately moved almost a million miles away from its true anchorage and finds itself in, in such confusion, such uncertainty, such a predicament today that it hardly knows where to turn. 
And when you view that society where thousands upon thousands upon thousands are drifting through life into a lost eternity, with their minds blinded to the truth of the gospel, then will you not beg that the Lord himself would be pleased in his message? Open the eyes of the blind. Sound out that message, living God, and do the impossible. And turn a people back to yourself to find life and healing and comfort and joy and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, a time of reflection, a time for reflection. And then in verses 39 to 45, um, you will see that um, their home becomes also a place for ministry. Uh, all of this is, is with a view um, to the coming into the world of the Lord Jesus Christ. All this with a view to his being known and his being enjoyed. So it is very much uh, a life and a ministry that is being geared towards the world coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And here this couple now obliged to work from home and the ministry they exercise is a very striking ministry. And I want you to see that again, what happens here. Because Elizabeth in particular, but doubtless Zechariah as well, because the two of them are stuck there together, and I don't doubt that Zechariah had uh, a part to play in this, but uh, Elizabeth obviously is the one upon whom the passage focuses most clearly and most vocally. Uh, you will see that she has essentially a threefold ministry that she is now exercising in her home. And it, and it may just be through these days and through the circumstances that we find ourselves in that, that what the Lord is, is underlining for us as his people is that the real work of the gospel does not happen in this building, but it happens in and through your home. So, in a sense, he says, so, so go and work at it. And, and for many people, he has, he has kind of shifted them and obliged them to be at home and ask the question, so, so how, do I, how do I extend the kingdom? How do I commend the gospel in and through my home? And here you'll see that's, that's what Elizabeth is doing. She has, first of all, a mothering role. Mary comes immediately after this astonishing announcement has been made to her by the angel Gabriel, verses 26 to 38. And uh, we're talking here about the first three months of her pregnancy, first 12 weeks of pregnancy. Because if you read on down to verse 56, you'll find that Mary stayed there for three months. And those first three months for a teenage girl, newly pregnant, um, she may well have been nauseous. She may well have been uh, needing a, a lot of physical help and support. The whole thing entirely new to her. She may well have needed a lot of emotional support as well with all the hormonal changes taking place in her, needing someone to, to be that support and that help to her and finding in the home of Elizabeth that both her physical needs and her emotional needs, and it may well be her social needs as well, because uh, up in Nazareth, um, she is liable to become the focus of everyone's gossip. As you know, everyone sees uh, uh, Mary just becoming just that slightly bit larger, beginning to uh, raise their eyebrows, whisper behind, um, and deliberately almost the Lord takes her out of that context and provides her with, with shelter in the home of Elizabeth, uh, which is a long way away. The whole country of Judea is a long way away from Nazareth, which is way up north in the land of Israel. And the Lord affording to, uh, to Mary here uh, a, a, a mothering ministry on the part of Elizabeth, who will look after her physically, emotionally, and socially as well. Along with that, um, I think Elizabeth clearly has a mentoring role for Mary. Uh, I think to some extent that's why Mary gravitates down to the hill country of Judea to spend the time with her relative. She is an older woman who is able to give to her practical advice, 
And I know it's, it's kind of new for Elizabeth as well, this whole business of being pregnant, but she is six months down the line. She is six months ahead. And so she is able, from a position of, of practical experience and immediately present experience, to provide the help and the guidance that uh, Mary herself needs in these early days of her own pregnancy, where doubtless she has a load of questions that uh, uh, she's not going to get answered in some antenatal class at the hospital in Nazareth or anything like that. It's just not available. She, she needs a lot of input, a lot of help in a very practical way. And uh, Elizabeth is able to afford her that practical guidance, that practical instruction, that practical help, the exercises maybe that she should do, a whole load of practical stuff. She is able to provide that mentoring ministry in that regard. And clearly also, able to, to provide the spiritual support and encouragement that Mary needs as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, uh, to have been privileged with a visit from an angel and the angel announcing this remarkable thing that the, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be with child and the child that you'll bear uh, will be indeed the, the Savior, the one promised from along. Uh, that's marvelous, but it's, it's a huge responsibility. And she gravitates to a senior lady an older lady who herself is spiritually minded, uh, who herself is able to provide her with the, the spiritual guidance, the spiritual instruction, the spiritual support as to how to handle that sort of responsibility in her life. And Elizabeth fulfills that sort of role as well for Mary at this juncture, uh, a mentoring role. Um, and if you, you turn to the, the pastoral epistles, and you'll find that Paul in 1 Timothy, and then again in Titus, it is one of the things that he is underlining in the, the life of the fellowship of God's people in Ephesus and in Crete. Timothy was in Ephesus, Titus was in Crete. In the lives of these fellowships, he's saying, so older women, uh, help the younger women. They need a lot of support. They need a lot of encouragement. They need a lot of mentoring. So, so get alongside them and provide that for them. Um, it's, it's that sort of thing that Elizabeth here is providing for Mary in her home. And in many ways, the home is the best place for it. The opportunity in a relaxed context to be able to engage with one another. I know, you know, uh, you're not allowed people in your house and things like that. Um, but we're, we're talking here about the, the basic principle and, and how it gets applied in any particular context, obviously, will vary. But, but it is the importance of recognizing under God that the, the ministry that we are able to exercise, called upon to exercise, does not in many ways primarily center around this building. It centers around the, the focal points of your life, which may well be, for many of you, your home. And the fact that you're stuck in your home uh, doesn't mean you are stuck away from the opportunity to minister. It just means you minister in a different context. It may be in your place of work. Um, that's where ministry happens. Um, that mothering role on the part of Elizabeth, translate that for, for you guys into uh, a more fathering role. Um, young lads need that sort of thing as well, uh, the need for that sort of mentoring too. But you'll see the third role that Elizabeth exercises here is not just a mothering role, not just a mentoring role, but also a priestly role as well. The priest, Zechariah, is on mute. He can't speak, he can't say anything. So he is not able to articulate the blessing of God. And you'll see in these verses uh, um, how Elizabeth speaks to Mary and pronounces the blessing three times over. Blessed are you, blessed is the child, blessed is the one who has believed. She is pronouncing the priestly blessing. She is, she is the mouthpiece for the blessing of God himself. She is empowered by the Spirit of God. Uh, and that's, that's what we need to understand as the kind of backdrop to all that the Lord calls us to be and to do in our lives. The Spirit of God is poured out upon us so that we might exercise that sort of ministry in our home with our neighbors, among our friends, and to those who may be our relatives in one way or another as well. We exercise that sort of ministry whereby as now priests, each and every one, we, we bestow and bring the blessing of God upon those uh, amongst whom we live and with whom we come in contact. Um, that's what Elizabeth is doing. 
um, and, and doing so not in an apologetic sort of way, but with all the authority and with all the grace and with all the power of the Holy Spirit. I think that's the reference there to the, the kind of volume level. She cries out, um, articulating the blessing that Mary might understand that what the angel had said, blessed are you, uh, is indeed the reality. God is pleased to bless. And she is, she is doing the priestly thing. And it is that that we are called to do and to be in Christ Jesus. To be those priests through whom the blessing of God flows out to others. And uh, we, we sometimes, when people sneeze, we say, bless you. Um, and if only we understood the reality of that, um, that, that actually it's not just when people sneeze that we have the opportunity to bless them, but it is in one context after another, day by day to be the instruments of God blessing his people. God blessing your neighbors, God blessing your friends, God through you uh, overflowing that grace that has been your experience in Jesus Christ and causing that grace to bathe and bless those around you as well. And therefore, um, this whole business here of uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth working from home ties into our situation uh, nationally in these days, whereby that has become a feature of our lives. Okay, says the Lord. Um, so be it. Maybe you will learn from that to understand, first of all, what the gospel is, and then to recognize that where the Lord has set you, he will minister through you as well, and do so in the way that uh, Elizabeth here ministers to Mary. Maybe, maybe you might like to ask the Lord to, to bring you into contact with those to whom you may indeed minister that grace. Maybe ask the Lord to, to show you those amongst whom you already are that he means you to be the instrument of his blessing to in your day-by-day -day living. Mary stayed there for three months, verse 56. She enjoyed the ministry of Elizabeth and Zechariah in their home. And please God, we shall learn ourselves, however many months down the line it is for ourselves, uh, we may learn ourselves how to use our home, how to use our work context in such a way that we exercise a ministry there as well. May God then bless his word to all our hearts. Our Father, would you take your word and would you seal that word to our hearts Help us to see in our individual situations uh, just how it applies. And instead of the, the frustration that so often fills our hearts, grant us rather that flexibility in our thinking that enables us to recognize what it is that you are saying, what it is that you are doing, and ourselves simply to become the instruments of your doing that by your spirit. And we'll gladly give you the praise and the glory for it. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Well, as we close off our service this morning, we're going to join in the singing of the hymn, As With Gladness, Men of Old.
as always, it's been our pleasure to have shared our worship with you this morning. We do trust that you will have known God's rich blessing and know his continued hand upon you. And as you go from here, and whatever it is that you face, may you go in the knowledge of his presence with you. To that end, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.